Good morning, everybody. Well, it was a pretty calamitous week for the Prime Minister, wasn't it? That was a fiasco in Manchester. And by the way, I'm not talking about the fact she had a bad cough. I've stood up and given conference speeches when I felt pretty under the weather too. No, it was the fact that the signage fell off the ceiling, that the security was so bad that a comedian got right up next to the Prime Minister and then seemed to be locked in endless conversation with the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson. And the messaging. You know, true Conservatives who'd been told this was going to be the conference at which they'd hear the free market message and all they got was, well, caps on energy prices, uh, the fact that the state, once you're dead, will own your organs and can use them uh, for transplants without first seeking your permission. It was actually a big state speech. It didn't work at any level. And this morning... We've got people like Nicola Sturgeon appearing on interviews saying how sorry they feel for the Prime Minister. Not good uh, when a leader is evoking sympathy. A leader needs to be respected. A leader doesn't need to be liked. But sympathy isn't good at all. But something interesting amidst all the speculation, and yeah, the newspapers are full of it, is Boris going to be sacked? How many plotters does Grant Shapps have? But amidst it all... Something slightly interesting that maybe moves this on. Uh, The Sunday Telegraph says, May plans for no EU deal. And really interesting that Ruth Davidson, who, you know, the the Scottish leader of the Tories and really rather popular at the moment, one of the more pro-EU figures in the Conservative Party, and she this morning has said that she's quite prepared to countenance no deal. So I'm just beginning to wonder, you know, as Mrs May gets herself ready for the next crucial Leaders' Summit, which takes place on the 19th of October in Brussels, where she goes and meets the other 27 heads of state, and, of course, Juncker, Barnier and Verhofstadt too. Is Mrs May the right leader to go to Brussels to negotiate Brexit? So please let me know what you think. Perhaps you think, absolutely, she's a wonderful leader. She'll knock them dead when she goes out there in a couple of weeks' time. Call me on 0345 973 Or maybe you think, actually, she's hopeless. And the fact that an opinion poll says that 42% still think she's right uh, to lead the negotiations uh, doesn't really work for you. Text me on 84850, or perhaps you think someone better could do the negotiations, in which case, on Twitter, go to LBC using the hashtag Farage and LBC, and watch me live on Facebook. So we're going to talk about that. Is this the right leader to go to Brussels and negotiate Brexit? And later on in the show, we will talk, of course, about Catalonia, where perhaps they're going to declare independence on Tuesday. Is that going to lead not just to police but to military action? And also this morning, I'll tell you why Hillary Clinton hates me, because it's there in the Sunday Times magazine this morning. And I always think it's a good thing in life to be judged by your enemies, and if she hates me... I'm not that unhappy. Now, Mrs May, we are now going to go to an independently-minded backbencher. He's the Conservative MP for Wellingborough and Rushton. He was a co-founder of the Grassroots Out campaign, which I was a part of. He's a Eurosceptic, uh, not one to mince his words. Good morning, Peter Bone. Good morning, Nigel. So, I mean, Peter, were you there in the hall in Manchester? Um, not for the leader's speech. I went to... Um David Davis, Liam Fox and, um, and Boris's speech, but the leader's speech is best listened to on the radio, under normal circumstances. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't normal. I mean, it was a complete humiliating car crash for her, wasn't it? No, I'm not, I'm not, not buying that. First of all, she has a cold. Well, we all get cold. Sure. The breach in security was amazing. Why that guy wasn't trampled on by three heavy blokes immediately moved towards the Prime Minister's beyond my... I, don't, I just don't understand that. Agreed, agreed. And, and they ought to find out who who um, fixed the stage prop. I mean, the, the fact there was nothing... The speech itself was, was fine, but nobody's talking Was it? So you're speech, happy, was... Peter, are you? You're happy that price caps are going to be introduced, state intervention... I mean, good socialism, Peter. You're really happy with that, are you? <laughs> yeah, no, no, sorry. I, I, there were one or two things that I wasn't happy with. <laughs> well, I'm sure. <laughs> you, just, no, you just nailed them. <laughs> But, I mean, if she's going to go to Brussels on the 19th of October, and that happens to be my birthday, and if she was uh, say, we've had enough of you lot, lot, this negotiation is going nowhere, we're pulling out tomorrow, bye-bye, that'd be a very nice birthday present for me. And she, she's, sort, she, she's a sort of, as, as someone said, a bloody-minded woman who might just do that, who knows? 
does she command the support of the party? I mean, and I ask you that, Peter, because I was in Manchester last week, and what I found really interesting was I was meeting, talking, interviewing people like you who were all saying, no, 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 we must be loyal to the leader. And then once the microphone was switched off, they were all saying, gosh, she's hopeless, isn't she? I mean, where do you stand on this? Is she really right to be your leader now? I didn't, by the way, what you just said, I didn't find. I was, I didn't find any support for sort of the, uh, the Europhile plot that was uh, mounted to three MPs. Um, I didn't find any support for that. And, and I've been talking to my association and the people in my constituency, and they're all saying, look, we're a day nearer coming out of the European Union. She's doing what she said she was doing. She's going to get us out. Why on earth? Would you idiots want to change the leader? Because goodness knows what we might. Well, because up with. because she's no good. She doesn't deliver very good messages. She blew the election. I mean, there's quite a lot of reasons, really, aren't there? Well, the, the thing that probably matters to me most, and I absolutely, I'm sure matters to you most, is whether we deliver Brexit. Uh-huh. And at the moment, and I said to you, if she delivers a clean yeah. Brexit, she'll be a national hero. Um, I, I'm not. I now think what is going to happen. Uh, I don't. And I, and I think you'd be difficult to argue about this. And the Europeans are not going to agree to a deal with us. Therefore, we need to come out and trade, if you like, well, um, WTO rules. Mm-hmm. Now, what what I want the Prime Minister to do, and I obviously it will be after the European Council when it, when she doesn't make any more progress. He says, look, this is what it's going to look like if we don't get a deal. Because I was with a leading. Uh, employer in this country, 300,000 people they employ in, in, in this country and what they said, they don't care whether we do a deal or come out on WTO rules they just want to know what it will look like so what the, what the Prime Minister's got to sh- show after the European Council is what it will look like when we don't get a deal and, and then that of course the Europeans will realise oh, we're serious about this I just don't think there's any chance of a deal I don't think it's the European Union want to do a deal because they are so in love with this European super state so I think the best chance for getting what uh, I want and you want is to it, it, it's for Theresa May to go and, which do, would, uh, and be as awkward as she wants to be. Which would represent a big turnaround from Florence the other week when she said that the EU's absolutely wonderful um, and we're going to stay part of all of it just under a different rebadge name <laughs> uh, pretty much pretty much what she said. Peter, I well, mean I, I, I Did I like the Florence speech? No, I didn't but no. he, she certainly didn't quite say that Well, um, I, I think um, She shouldn't be giving them any money uh, uh, Qu- uh, uh, Quintin oh. Letts in the Daily Mail said the only thing she stopped short of was offering Juncker a peerage which I thought was about <laughs> right uh, Peter, well, if she was going to offer, look, if she was going to offer anyone a peerage, it should be you. Oh, well, and much, it, and it, it was very really sweet of you on a Sunday for. morning, but there's not much chance of it. Peter, I think my view, my view strongly, is that she perhaps has one last chance, maybe one last chance to save her premiership, to perhaps unite the party, and to show Brussels that she means business. Because at the minute, they are laughing about her behind the back of their hand. They really are, I know, because I have to have the misfortune to work with these people. If she goes on the 19th, your birthday, to Brussels, and says, right, we're not mucking about anymore, we want a grown-up trade deal with you, here's the deadline, if you don't want to meet it, we will then simply leave. If she did that, would she unite the party behind her? Absolutely. I mean, that, that would be the best thing that she could possibly say. OK. Um, I, I, what, no, I got a question for you. If it wasn't Mrs May, who would you have to lead us to, to, to come out of the EU? Do oh, well, I would be looking, one? Peter, I'd be looking for an independently-minded backbencher of some kind, um, <laughs> somebody who was unafraid to speak their minds, um, perhaps even an MP that sort of was somewhere in the middle of the country, I don't know, um, the sort of county that you're in at the moment. Uh, Peter, I don't really care. I just think, I think she's badly damaged goods, but, but there's always a chance in life for people to redeem themselves, however bad it looks. And I have to say, I agree with you, if she does a complete vault fast from Florence, comes out kicking, comes out fighting, there may be a chance. Peter Bone, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, Peter Bone there, who was fairly honest that he didn't like the Florence speech, he didn't like much of what she said in Manchester, but he thinks if she gets tough, she can regain credibility and her standing in the party. I would say this is last chance saloon. That's my view. Um, I'm perhaps being kind this morning. I wonder what Keith in Stoke Newington thinks. Keith, good morning. Yeah, good morning, Nigel. Yes, I think it's the wrong time to change, have a, a leadership challenge at the moment. And I also think it's totally wrong to get rid of Boris Johnson. Uh, and Because I think he realises Theresa May is being 
somewhat weak and her decision making capability is somewhat challenging, particularly after the evidence for the last general election, the way she did it, the decisions there. And Boris Johnson <coughs> is giving her a kick up the backside and being very strong. This whole situation reminds me of, of Chamberlain and people took peace in our time when they got rid of Churchill mm. because he was acting like Boris Johnson being very strong and they didn't like it. And in the end, he had to, Churchill had to go in and sort the thing out. Well, the and difference I, was, Keith, Keith, the difference was that Chamberlain was the Prime Minister and Churchill was a backbencher, which is why when someone like Peter Bone comes on the show, as backbenchers, they are much freer to speak. The real difference is that Boris Johnson is the Foreign Secretary, and you could say that both before Florence and, indeed, before her conference speech, that he effectively upstaged her. Well, I agree. I think he needed to, because okay. he recognised she's being weak. And she, he, he needed to do something to, to reset the programme and give her a push. That's why he did it, I'm sure. OK, so you would like the team to stay together as they are. Do you think, Keith, do you... And, and as I say, you know, as someone that works in Brussels, I know her credibility is shot with them at the moment. They don't really think she's serious. If she goes on the 19th of October and starts to talk tough, do you think that could save her premiership? I think I think it could. If she pulls the hat out of the bag, I think she could. She's learning her lessons of leadership, and it takes a bit of time to do that. But the other points I wanted to make, Nigel... One more, one more, and then we run out of time. One more point, Keith. Well, ever since we've been trading, in the start of the East India Company, we beat the hell out of the rest of the traders through, through good international trading. And the, and the European is terrified. The Europeans are terrified of us because they're never going to beat us. So they're trying to control us and stop us, which is what they've done in history. Yep. Well, all we need then is the courage to do something about it. Keith, I thank you. Right now, you're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show. The week's been a total shocker for the Prime Minister, and the newspapers are full of stories of campaigns against her within the party, the prospect of Boris being sacked, and she's in a very bad place. But the rebellion has not reached sufficient size to get rid of her. I think they'd be better with somebody else, but she's going to stay for a bit. And that's why I think going as our leader on the 19th of October to this summit, she's got a chance. If she completely turns around from Florence, she perhaps has one last chance to re-establish her credibility. If it doesn't happen then, then there'll be many others speaking out and saying it's time to go. Does she deserve that one last chance, or should she simply go now and be replaced by somebody else? I wonder what John in Formby makes of that proposition. Good morning. I think she should go now. I think she's a busted flush. And I think all the parallels with uh, Neville Chamberlain uh, are true. It's rather like 1940, when people wanted a more vigorous prosecution of the war. And we're not getting it from her. She doesn't have the confidence of her party, despite what they say. Uh, the public, I think, have lost faith in her, and she's become something of a Jonah figure that needs throwing overboard, although I do hope the whale has a cough. Yeah, I mean, this is, John, my observation is so many of them in public say they support her, but in private uh, they'd like to get rid of her. The, the fear they have, the reason she hasn't gone, John, is because what they fear is a leadership contest with a Brexiteer versus a Remainer, a party in crisis, and a country that then calls for a general election, and perhaps Mr Corbyn coming into Downing Street. That's all that's keeping her in position, John, in my view. I think they're misguided, because uh, we all know she's not going to fight the next election, and the fight back should start now. They get someone confident and competent in, and uh, we've surely give ourselves a much better chance of making better progress. So who, John? Come on, tell us. Reveal. Oh, well, uh, we've, we've got uh, the, the three Brexiteers and then the, uh, the dark horse, uh, the Mog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So which of them, which of them could, and they've got to do two things, one, unite the party, and two, let Brussels know we're not going to be bullied around and we should be taken seriously. Who fits that job? Well, I would like to see uh, a, a debate and uh, let them put up their stalls and uh, uh, buy from the, the, the best offer accordingly. OK, fine. John, thank you. John thinks she's got to go. She's shot. It's a joke. It's not working. John says we need a fresh start for Britain on Facebook. Marty says even if May was replaced, her replacement still would not play a major part in the Brexit negotiations. You know that, Nigel. Well, look, David Davis 
and his department, they're the ones doing it hands-on with Monsieur Barnier and his team. But let's be honest, the position the British leader takes, especially at these big summits that happen a few, a few times every year, is absolutely crucial. And I, when I was in Strasbourg last week, OK, Catalonia dominated uh, everything that was happening that morning. But what was interesting was the Verhofstadt's and others really are very happy because what she did was to concede. Concede we need to have a transitional period. Concede another up to 20 billion sterling for that period. And we keep conceding and they keep saying, oh no, 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 that's not enough. We want more than that. So they think they've effectively got her on the run. Uh, and to turn that around is going to take some performance on the 19th of October. Now, that's enough from me, because unlike all the other Sunday morning shows on television and radio, where it is commentators talking to each other, politicians talking to each other, journalists talking to each other, the whole point of LBC is this is the place where the public get to have their say. John is in South End on Sea. Good morning, John. Hi, Nigel. I have to say it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Good morning. Uh, well, thank you. And so, 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 John, should she go now, or does she, or does she realistically have one last chance to turn this thing around? Well, I mean, I couldn't agree with everything you've said. Every, you know, everything you've said is spot on. I mean, she's not going to go, is she? Depressingly, but she's she's like the wind. She's she looks like a, you know, she just I don't know. She, she's not the person. But You're John, person. but John, I'm she sold to... herself. She, no, I'm not the person. She sold herself to the country. Strong and stable leadership. Do you begin to doubt that? <laughs> Well, it's, it's, it's anything but. She looks scared out of her brains, to be honest with you. But, I mean, the, the interesting thing you were just saying about that a party speech uh, last week was just this fallacy that the Conservatives are, are capitalists. I mean, it was it was the biggest uh, state socialist speech I've ever heard. I mean, it's, it's just depressing. We just need a real Brexiteer in there, and we need a real Tory government with to Tory principles. But it well, isn't happening, is it? Well, she will stay as leader for now, John. But unless she does something quite dramatic to turn this around, she will, in my view, be gone by Christmas because support is leeching away. John, I thank you. Now, an outfit called Brexit Watch say, I think Nigel Farage is afraid of a no-Brexit deal. He will never admit it. Now, listen here, Brexit Watch. I coined the phrase in the referendum, no deal is better than a bad deal. No deal is better than where we are now, paying up to £10 billion every single year into an organisation that over-regulates many of our industries, takes away our fishing waters and bans us from making our own trade deals with other parts of the world. I would like a grown-up, sensible trade deal, and I made that speech in Berlin a few weeks ago and in Prague just a fortnight ago to say, look, you know, we are a great export market for you, we're happy to go on with sensible free trade, but from what I can see from the Junkers, the Barniers, the Verhofstadt, what I can see from these people is total obstructionism. Anyway, they're far too busy defending police barbarity in Catalonia than to worry about a UK trade deal. I'm not scared in the least. Ed in Hounslow, are you scared of no deal, Ed? Good morning, uh, Nigel. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm very scared that there are a great many people who would like that to be the case, and uh, well done to your good self for the, you know, the years of tireless effort that you put in to ensure that we would be in the position that we're in now, and thank God for it. Well, um, actually, Ed, um, Ed, to be honest with you, I don't want us to be in the position we're in now. I want I us, I want us having voted for Brexit, I didn't want to wait nine months, trigger Article 50. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't want the Article 50 process to last two years unless it absolutely had to. Now I'm being yeah. told there's a transition deal, and what was the, what was the sort of weasel wording she used that would last around two years, which means yeah, to the next exactly. general election. So, Ed, you know, I was, I was pleased to play whatever role I did in getting that referendum, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, I want some action. Yes, absolutely, and so do all of us people out here who are listening to this nonsense that we hear repetitively on the radio about, you know, Remainers uh, wanting us to do this and that and other. As regards to Theresa May, uh, the uh, performance that she put on the other day, I don't think that Rowan Atkinson could have put on a better performance. <laughs> I, I think she has to be known now as Mrs Bean, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, it was. And as, re as, as regards to whether she should, what, should she stay or should she go, I think we should consult the Moody Blues. You remember their record? Go, go on. Now? 
Go now. Go now. Da, 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 yeah, da, 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 now. Da, yeah, I do. And I, think that's, I think that's what she's got to do. Um, she, she's a laughing stock. She's a liability. Well, um, I think she should go, Ed, but she's not going to go because the party isn't yet ready to ditch her. And therefore, maybe, just maybe, Ed, she has one last chance on the 19th of October to redeem herself. We'll see. Ed from Hounslow there, like a lot of Brexiteers. And it's a voice that I don't think we hear and see enough of in mainstream media. There are many, many, many millions of Brexit voters out there who are pretty blooming angry about the time all this is taking. Mark from Sevenoaks, what's your perspective? Good morning. Good morning. Um, well, really, I, I, people seem to be trying to choose the leader of negotiations who will negotiate the, the, the deal they want. And I think there's a different way of looking at it. I mm -hmm. think that we ought to be uh, negotiating several deals, and it could be easier actually to do that than to just stick to one, because we could start with a deal which was close to what we have now and gradually add in the things that we want. And it, that way the deal process will be easier, and the choice could be made later on uh, by Parliament or whatever as to which one to go for. It would mean that everybody could have their uh, push their own particular view and get a deal of the sort they want and choose later. So that would be sort of a multiple choice type option, Mark. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes, I am. I think that the, the, the negotiations would go better. It would be a better example to the situation, the terrible situation in Spain that's uh, Awful. evolving. Awful. And uh, I also think that it will, it will avoid a, a potential problem that I think hasn't been talked about enough. With the transition period lasting as it does, It'll be almost five years since the referendum. I know. Time. That's, what's, that's what's making as many of us angry, Mark. I understand that, but, but, there's, a, but it's, there's a difficulty with it. Because by then, there'll be four to five million people who didn't get a vote in the referendum because they were too young. And the question then is, will the MPs be willing to say to those people, no, you're not having a say. Oh, by the way, in a few months' time, vote for me in the general election. Mm. So, mm -hmm. I, I, with the multiple choice deal, Interesting. you're giving the possibility of a compromise. And I, I know that some people may not want a compromise, they may want exactly what they want. But there's the potential, if there is just a, a rather hard deal, that the MPs will not wish to pay for Brexit with their seats. I mean, you've, you've managed to persuade, remarkably, there are many Remainers to, in the name of democracy, give up and pay for it with their freedom well, of movement. Mark, one thing I don't like about your multiple choice deal is the idea that it would stretch, stretch out for a long, long time. Um, and I would like this all done and dusted well before the next general election. But I thank you. In a very interesting approach there from Mark in Sevenoaks. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show here at LBC. More sceptical than me when it comes to the question of whether Mrs May's the right person to go to Brussels on the 19th of October, represent our country and set out a fresh position on Brexit. Jimmy says Theresa May and her backers have no intention of actually leaving the European Union. It's all a charade. Well, I hope you're wrong, Jimmy. There'll be a lot of anger. A lot of anger, uh, if you would have turned out to be right. Theo says, no deal with May. Apply the WTO rules, even unilaterally. Any delay makes no sense. David's quite upset. He says, we voted leave. It should happen before the general election. Any party that wants to fight the next one on going back into the EU is welcome to do so. It doesn't change the fact we voted leave. My concern, David, and it kind of links in a bit, to Mark's call from Seven Oaks before the break. The worry is, with transition and everything else, that effectively it becomes unfinished business at the time of the next general election. That's my concern. I wonder what Sean in Blackpool thinks of the whole thing. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Uh, so I say how nice it has been somebody who is so intellectual and knows what Britain needs. Well, I mean, I, 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 I'm called many things by some that like me and other things by those that don't, Sean. But I, you know, I, I mean, I've always thought, I've always thought that Brexit would give us a fantastic opportunity. And I'm just really frustrated we're not gripping it, Sean. Yeah, well, at the moment, I'm currently in hospital after being in uh, a car accident and I've oh, paralysed on my left side. Gosh. Uh, actually, the NHS is struggling. I've seen patients waiting on trolleys in corridors in hospital, in the hospital I'm currently at, for up to 18 hours because they're struggling for nursing staff, they're struggling for, for beds. And this is all because of all the cuts that Theresa May and her party have done. Now, if the Article 51 had been triggered, 
388 million pounds a week will be pumped back into the NHS. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, that may be over-egging it a bit, Sean. Um, but, you know, certainly we could put some of the Brexit uh, savings into the National Health Service. That's true. Um, but isn't the real problem that you're... That you're and by the way, I'm very sorry to hear about your, your, your difficulties. But isn't the real problem that you're seeing there in Blackpool that our population is rising by half a million every year um, and, and our growth in hospital and medical services simply isn't keeping up? Yes, that's, that's right. that is right. But... That, again, that is because of the Conservative Party. The party needs to go and let Labour take over. Jeremy Corbyn is the man we need in Brussels. Well, Sean, do you know something? I, I might have agreed with that a few months ago, because much as I disagree with a lot of what Corbyn stands for, he's always on the European Union for 30-something years, been sound as a pound, as far as I'm concerned, believing we should govern ourselves, make our own laws, uh, not be part of a system uh, that is very much in hock to multinationals and giant banks and all the rest of it. But the trouble is, Sean, that now Corbyn's been turned by his own parliamentary party. He's now supporting transition. They're even limbering up to keep us in the single market. So maybe, Sean, maybe Jeremy Corbyn has let people down at the moment even worse than the Conservatives. Yeah, but uh, the youth love Jeremy Corbyn. And, and, you know, that's something that we need to we need to focus on, is getting our country back to the way it used to be, getting out of the EU by triggering, triggering Article 51. Out of 50. Well, Sean, we'll see. And how much longer are you going to be stuck in the hospital? Uh, a few months. A few months. Gosh. Our thoughts are with you, Sean. Be patient. I've spent uh, once several months in hospital. It's uh, pretty mind-numbing. And, and uh, even aside from whatever you're suffering from, it's a very difficult psychological thing to go through. Horrible. Don't recommend it. Uh, we haven't anyone in the current government that isn't laughed at on the international stage, says Mark on Twitter. Um, would they laugh at Boris? Yeah, actually, they probably would. But anyway, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean he wouldn't do a good job. He might. Who knows? What does Lisa in Stanford think? Lisa, good morning. Morning, Nigel. Um, yeah, I I actually don't think it matters who we have um, leading the company. Certainly, as um, as far as Brexit is goes, um, I'd like to tell you what what I'd I'd heard on. Uh, I was watching BBC Parliament last week, uh -huh. and it was the um, MEP. Lob, yes. you were there. Yes, I was. Um, and um, and you'd raise the, um, the the argument over the Catalonian situation. Now I don't know if you'd left the room at this time, but they carried on slating Britain and mm -hmm. Brexit and all that. And then there was an Austrian MEP stood up. I can't remember his name, and he basically was saying that he thought the way that that Europe were treating the UK was disgraceful. He said, I've heard a lot of you, meaning the EU lot over there, uh -huh. in the corridors, saying that they didn't want UK to leave um, Europe, that they were going to stop UK leaving Europe. They were going to block them at every juncture. And he was saying that he thought it was disgraceful. He said the British people... Well, are Lisa, your point, your point is very interesting, and I, and I did talk about this during the week, but what happened in the European Parliament, apart from the Catalonian issue, which I'm going to talk about after 11 o'clock, because I feel very strongly that the fact the EU, which pretend to be all for human rights and dignity of the individual, uh, you know, effectively backed the Spanish government's action in Barcelona and elsewhere in Catalonia last week as the use of necessary force. That was one thing going on. The other thing, Lisa, that was going on was uh, that charming Mr Verhofstadt had a resolution that he put before the European Parliament, and it was to make a series of demands on Britain as to what Britain needs to do before they will even contemplate talking to us about trade. And as part of that resolution, they went very much further than anything you've heard talked about so far by Juncker, Barnier, etc. Um, and that passed by 557 votes to 92. And the biggest worry of all I've got, Lisa, is if we do spend goodness knows how long um, on negotiations, ultimately, under the Article 50 process, the European Parliament could veto the whole blooming thing. So this is not a straightforward procedure. Um, and so I'm going to disagree with your first point. I think it does matter who leads the country. I think, Lisa, it's time we actually went to that European summit and got tough.
Absolutely. Uh, I absolutely agree. But can Theresa May do it? Is it within her to do it? Or is she now past her sell-by date? And is it only a matter of time before she goes? I feel sorry for her, and I would like to give her a chance, but she has got to toughen up. She really has. Yeah, I, 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 you know, when you say you feel sorry for her, it's exactly what Nicola Sturgeon was saying this morning. Uh, if, if we're feeling sorry for our leader, it's not a very good place, Lisa, is it? It's not, it's not. No, it's no. not. Listen, thank you ever so much for your call. Philip says to me on Facebook, whoever took her place would have the same problems. Too much division. Philip, that may be true, but I thought it was very, very interesting that this morning, Ruth Davidson, who, you know, is seen as a bit of an up-and-coming star, they won 13 seats in Scotland at the election, uh, she's clearly uh, clearly being invited onto every major media show there is out there, and, you know, what's interesting is she's always been seen as being very pro-single market, very much more pro-EU uh, than the majority um, of, 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 of the Conservative Party. And there she is this morning on the Mar Show saying, actually, no deal could be the right solution. So I just wonder whether, I wonder whether they see an opportunity here because they realise that the Labour Party have effectively said to people who want to end freedom of movement and want to leave the single market, sorry guys, we're betraying you. So I wonder whether there's a bit of political positioning. I wonder whether they're beginning to see that by taking a more resolute Brexit line, it might do them some good. I wonder what Susan in Liverpool thinks. Good morning. Uh, morning, uh, morning, Nigel. So, should May go, Susan? Yeah, I want her gone. Right. Um, I want her gone. She is a weak, and I actually don't feel sorry for her. I think she's quite arrogant, because I think she knows that she is unsuitable to take us out of the EU. Uh -huh. And I think she is quite stubborn about it, and that's why she's staying, but I think she needs to go. And if she goes, and, and who knows, you know, she might at some point between now and Christmas say that she's suffering ill health or whatever it may be. These things have happened in the past. Is there an obvious replacement, Susan? Well, there is for me. Is it's there? Got to be Muggsy. It's got to be Jacob rees -Mogg. I mean, to be honest with you, I have three people on my list that I would like to leave this country. Uh -huh. And I don't just mean out of the EU. I mean for everything else. Yeah. Three people on my list is obviously your good self. Right. Um, uh, that, but, that's, but that's obviously a pipe dream, but it's something that I would have loved to have seen. Um, the second is Jacob rees mogg yep. and the third guy is a guy who actually isn't an MP, but is Douglas Murray, who talks a lot of sense about the safety of this country and about the safety of these lovely people in this country. Yeah, yeah, Douglas Murray, writer, blogger, etc., um, and somebody that's been warning about radical Islam for many, many, many years. Well, Susan, you might get Jacob rees mogg I don't know, but I thank you, and Susan, they're absolutely clear that May has to go. You're listening to the Sunday edition of The Nigel Farage Show. <laughs> Some are calling for May to go in public. Grant Shapps claims there are about 30 Conservative MPs that wanted to go right now. Others are keeping their powder dry. Everybody agrees it isn't really going very well, but they're terrified that if the Prime Minister goes, that there'll be a leadership election, more division, and perhaps it'll even lead to a general election. But what interests me this morning is the Prime Minister... He's indicating, and we see the front page of a Sunday Telegraph on this, they're indicating that they are, at last, genuinely preparing for a no-deal scenario. And the story is that money is going to get spent, um, in particular, uh, with new technology to speed up customs checks at borders if the UK reverts to World Trade Organisation rules. And I'm just wondering... Does that give the Prime Minister one last chance if she was to go on the 19th of October to the Leaders' Summit in Brussels and really stick it to them and make it clear that, you know, we're not going to get pushed around anymore by these people? Could that perhaps bring the party together? Interesting. Nigel, I've just watched Ruth Davidson on the Andrew Marr show. She's the person we need as Prime Minister, says Jay. But again, you see, Jay, the point is quite a big shift in Ruth Davison's political position this morning, saying she's prepared to accept no deal as well. So maybe this Prime Minister, who's been described as the walking dead and many other things, maybe she has one last chance. I don't know. I wonder what Stan, who's calling from Haverhill, thinks of that. Good morning. All right, Nigel, how are you? I'm very well, Stan. Very well indeed. So who's the right person, Stan, to lead us into these Brexit talks? Well, you, they keep saying about him, but... 
I honestly reckon it's going to be at Jacob Reed mode because he's very smart, isn't he? He's very on the ball, and he's got all these witty comebacks, and he's well respected in the houses of Parliament. But and you I just can't see. But Stan, you could argue. You could argue. Uh, and yeah, Jacob's great value. If that was no question, it was very funny, wasn't it, seeing him in Manchester talking to a snarling protester? It was very, very amusing. But, oh, but yeah, he's very calm, wasn't he? It, well, he yeah, is. No, he is. He's 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 very together. But Stan, he's got no um, political record in office of any kind at all. He takes a position on abortion, on gay marriage that would probably be anathema to a very large chunk of this country. And there are people who say to me, but he's just too posh, isn't he? Um, being able... To do, if you're posh or if you're common, it doesn't affect your ability to do a job, does it? Uh, I don't think it does, no. But, but you know, we, we did have, with Cameron's years... A lot of talk that perhaps it was time that one school didn't have quite the amount of dominance in British politics that it's had for the last 250 years, um, and that it was time to sort of move away from Eton. But no, so that, actually, I agree with you. I think it doesn't matter where you come from, what your accent is, if you come across as being honest and straightforward, that is what people increasingly want. Um, but if it was Jacob, all right, Stan, let's play a game. Yeah, okay. Theresa May goes next Monday, ill health. Jacob is anointed because Stan in Haverhill, amongst others, are pleading, you see, for Jacob. And Jacob uh, becomes the Prime Minister by acclamation, and he heads off to Brussels on Eurostar. Probably private, probably private jet, actually, but if he's Prime Minister. But, but he, he heads off on the 19th of October. What is it he should say, as the leader of this country, to get us the best deal? Are you going to actually bother negotiating with us and if you answer no, OK, bye. Right. Just, just, just say goodbye, and then we can have our own... We can write our own law... You know, we can have our own sovereignty, can't we? We can write our own laws. We can stop the flood of immigration, which we can't deny is happening. Mm -hmm. No, and, well, uh, well we, st we still have an open door. Yes, that's certainly true to the European Union. So that's OK. And you think Jacob's the man that would do that, yeah? 100% cert. He is the man to do it. OK, Stan, I thank you. Be quite fun seeing Jacob going to the European Council as our Prime Minister. He'd probably address them in Latin, wouldn't he, or Ancient Greek, or something like that. Um, Annabelle is calling from Twickenham. Annabelle, some people feel uh, sorry for Theresa May, sympathetic for the tough week that she's had. How do you feel? She's like you are a heap. Right, go on. She really is. <laughs> I mean, say, we need a strong person. We need someone like Macron, our version of Macron, and he would be Dominic Raab. Dominic Raab. Now, this is a name, this is a name that we don't hear very often. And yet, Annabelle, I, I first met Dominic Raab on Newsnight. Mm -hmm. It was a panel. And I'm thinking it's over 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. 11 years ago, 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was on the panel. Mm -hmm. Raab was on the panel. Mm -hmm. I'd never met him. I'd vaguely heard of his name. And by the end of that show, I thought, wow. This guy is really, really good. So I, I completely understand what you're saying. Um, what is it about Rob that makes you think he could be the He's right person? version of Macron. Just as simple as that, yeah? Yeah, because um, I think it needs to have someone who is an equal. And I think she's out of her depth. That's what I think. And I wouldn't mind people saying that. She's out of her depth. Um, and I've been thinking about that mm. all along because they're taking the rise out of the country and she's making the country a laughing stock. I think she has got to go for the sake of it. OK, Annabelle, perfectly clear that she's got to go. And Dominic Raab's name being thrown into the hat. And yeah, he is a very bright guy, a very smart performer and has a bit more experience around government than Jacob Rees-Mogg has got. Grenville is calling from Cumbria. Good morning. Good morning. So, what's to happen, Granville? Come on, give us a solution. Well, I, I think, from the start off, you've wasted 20 years of your life trying to get us out of Brexit, uh -huh. and uh, it's not going to happen. I think I think uh, Theresa May is the right person for the job, but the powers that be are just pulling the strings, and she isn't, she isn't going to do what they tell her, if you know what I mean. 
So you think there are big forces. I mean, we had a, I had a, um, earlier a text from Jimmy saying much the same thing. You think there are big global forces, ultimately, that want to string this out to the next general election and that ultimately the big money stops us from leaving Grenville. Is that what you really think? Yeah, I do. I mean, it, it's a simple solution. I mean, if I want to trade with my next door neighbour, I trade with him. But it's no, there's no big deal about it, is there? I mean, if the, tra- if the deal's right, you trade with him. But, oh, no, 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 I, un- I totally understand that. I mean, ultimately, trade is not done by governments. Trade is done because consumers look at a product and say, do you know what, I, I trust its reliability, I like the price. Sure, that's how business goes on. But I think it is a bit of a conspiracy theory, Grenville, to, to, to suggest that there are global forces that will stop Brexit from happening. No, I don't, I don't think it's a, I'm not a conspiracy theorist in, in, in itself. I just look at the bigger picture. I mean, when Theresa May first came into power and um, first became Prime Minister, she said all these wonderful things and I punched my fist in the air thinking she's the woman for the job. Mm-hmm. But as time's gone by, it's, it's, it's completely diverse everything that she's ever said. You know, every all these jams, all these sort of talks she's always done, she's just come and reverse from it. No, well, it's not been very impressive, Grenville, I think. I've got time for one quick last call. Tony and Farham, what's your point on Theresa May? Yes, hello, Nigel. I think uh, she missed a golden opportunity in Florence because what she should have done is she should have addressed the reasons um, to a European audience why the British people voted, albeit by a small majority, to leave the EU in the first place. Mm -hmm. Then, um, rather than stonewalling any sensible negotiations, uh, then that would have put them on the back foot. Um, She should have said it like it is. The reasons that uh, many people voted is because they can see the state that the Europe is and and, um, and what the EU has done to European economies over the last 10 years. But Uh, but given that she didn't take that chance, Tony, is it now too late for her? Or can she reassert some sort of authority in Brussels on the 19th of October? Well, that's that's what she needs to do. She has one last chance. One last chance. Tony, I agree with you. I've got to end it there. I'm out of time, but I agree with Tony. She probably does actually have one last chance. Now, hundreds of people are gathering in central Barcelona right now ahead of a rally to protest against the Catalan government's push for secession. We'll be crossing live to LBC's political editor. He's there in the midst of that march. But will Spain's reaction to the Catalonian referendum last week mean that independence separation is now inevitable. If you think the heavy-handed approach by Spain will drive more Catalonians towards independence, call me on 03456060973. Maybe you think Spain needs to remain united, in which case text on 840-84850. And if you're listening from Spain, you can ring, text or tweet Farage and LBC at LBC and watch me live on Facebook. We're live from London and Spain next. Last Sunday, we witnessed the most extraordinary scenes in Barcelona and across other parts of Catalonia. The government was going ahead, the regional government was going ahead with a referendum that had not been cleared nationally in Spain and had been declared illegal. And what the Spanish government decided to do was to use virtually every means available to them to prevent the vote from taking place at all. Would perhaps have been rather cleverer to say, you push ahead with your vote and we'll just call it invalid afterwards, but no, about 10,000 police turned up And as I say, it finished up with 900 people being injured, many of them hospitalised, as women were dragged by their hair from polling stations, old people beaten over the head with batons as the police tried to clear the stations, tried to stop people from voting. It really difficult to believe this was happening in what is supposed to be a modern Western democracy. Even more astonishing was that the European Union, who love to interfere in the affairs of every member state, whether it's criticising the Polish government for judicial appointments, condemning the Hungarians for not taking migrant quotas after Mrs Merkel let rather a lot of people in, or whether it's almost anything Britain does. You know, they're very quick to criticise, and they always say, the Union, they're about human rights, they're about the dignity of the individual, and yet, and yet... They, in the case of the Spanish treatment of people trying to vote in a referendum in Catalonia, ultimately they said that they thought necessary force had been used. And I was really, really angry about this. This is what I said to them in the European Parliament last Tuesday. 
Mr Juncker comes here for his one appearance in the Strasbourg session this week and there is absolutely no mention made of the dramatic events that have taken place inside a European Union member state that is allegedly a modern democracy. Now, one of the reasons that I... One of the reasons that I always wanted Brexit was because I thought the system of lawmaking whereby the Commission has the sole right to initiate legislation was something that would in fact damage and in the end destroy any concept of national democracy. And yeah, I've called the European Union undemocratic, I've called it anti-democratic, but never, ever, in, the, in my fiercest criticisms here, did I think we would see the police of a member state of the Union injuring 900 people in an attempt to stop them going out to vote. Okay. Whether or not, whether or not, whether or not it was legal nationally for people in Catalonia to have a vote, surely, surely people are allowed to express an opinion. We saw women being dragged out of polling stations by their hair, old ladies with gashes in their forehead. The most extraordinary display. And what do we get from Mr Juncker today? Not a dicky bird. Well, that was how I felt about it. And, and following on from not a dicky bird, uh, his, his number two, uh, Franz Timmermans, as I say, the next day said that sometimes you have to use necessary force. My view, my view is that Catalan separatism has always been in a minority, but has been growing over the course of the last few years. And my view is the way the Spanish government have behaved and the way the EU has behaved, I think it will drive more people towards wanting separation for Catalonia. That's my view. You can disagree with it. You can agree with it by calling 0345 60 60 973. You can text to 84850. You can tweet on at LBC using the hashtag Farage at LBC. You can watch us on Facebook and comment there too. And particularly if you're in Spain, any part of Spain, keen to hear what you've got to say. Now, LBC's political editor, Theo Usherwood, is now in Barcelona, where it's just after midday, of course, and he's amongst a march that is going on now. Theo, can you hear me? I can hear you, Nigel. I'm on a march for unity. This has been organised by the People's Party, uh, President Rajoy's party, to try and persuade Catalonia to remain part of Spain. There are chants for the Catalan president, uh, Carlos Puigdemont, to go to jail. There are calls for Spain to be united, that it's stronger and it will never be defeated as long as Catalonia remains. And I'm joined by a number of activists who are here trying to persuade Catalonia to remain part of Spain. Madam, why are you here? Uh, I'm here because we want to show the international community that you have only seen one part of our Yeah, I will have to come back to that. It all sounded very noisy and very dramatic uh, when the line went. Uh, but the point the lady was making is, of course, a very good point when she says, you've only seen one side of the story. And I, and I think, you know, that is true, that what we saw was the story of those that want Catalonia to separate and the way they were treated by the police. Um, and I guess what we were about to hear um, at a march where people are saying, no, we want Spain to stay together, is that that has always been the majority view. In fact, if you go back 10 or 15 years, the number of people who supported Catalonian separation was below 20%. Now, it has been building over the course of the last few years. And, and, and Catalonia, of course, remember, is the richest part of Spain. But, and here's the interesting thing, the European Union also said to them that if Catalonia wants to go ahead and separate from the rest of Spain, they wouldn't be allowed to join the European Union. The banks have been telling them that they would all uh, leave. So there's a huge amount of pressure is being put on uh, from the establishment to stop this from happening. And yet, and yet, when the Catalonian Parliament meets on Tuesday, it is possible that their First Minister, Mr Puigdemont, it's possible that he will simply declare independence. Now, if he does that, if he does that, how will the Spanish government react? We heard stories in the week that there were 16,000 Spanish soldiers on three cruisers moored 
off Barcelona and that they would come in and take over the government. So you can see there is the potential here for something really very nasty to happen. Andrew is calling me from Halifax. Andrew, good morning. Good morning, Nigel. Great to finally speak to you. Good morning. So what's your part of this story, Andrew? Well, I I'm like you on, on most things. I mean, I detest the European Union. I hope that it disintegrates within the next decade. But yep. I cannot, cannot support uh, the dismemberment of Spain. Uh, right. Against this push uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, one is that, uh, you know, states do have the right to secede if there is a history of tyranny or uh, a denial of fundamental human rights, such as the case in Kosovo or East Timor. But that's palpably not the case uh, with Spain. Uh, the Spanish government has bent over backwards. Oh, hang on, Andrew. Ha so Andrew, Andrew yeah. hang on, hang on. Whoa, down there. Last Sunday, last Sunday, the Spanish government had 10,000 police physically dragging people out of queues who wanted to go and vote. That was a denial of human rights, wasn't it? Well, let me put it to you like this. If people did defy less confrontational tactics, and that is what it takes to uphold the rule of law, is it disproportionate? Because if, if it is, you could argue that the action against the miners in 84-85 was disproportionate. Everything else had been tried. And another danger for me is that one of the biggest foreign delegations for this Catalan farce uh, came from parties from the United Kingdom. It came from the Tartan Army of SNP in Scotland, uh -huh. and it came from that terrorist apologising scum across the water in Ulster, Sinn Féin. They clearly believe that this could lead to a domino effect that could trigger separatist causes here in our own country, and that is something that's got to be resisted at all costs. Well, Andrew, I have never, I have never felt uh, any feeling towards the Catalan separatist movement at all. Uh, I've never really fully understood it. Um, I've obviously seen what Basque separatism has done in the other part of northern Spain over the years, but I've never had any strong feeling about it at all. But I have to say, since last Sunday, I begin to have a bit of sympathy with the Catalan separatists. And I put it to you, Andrew, that the way the police behaved, the fact that the EU won't condemn it, in fact support it, is likely, likely to drive more people towards separatist feelings. Uh, that's possibly the case, though I, I never take a, a teleological, um, you know, view on all this. There's, there's nothing inevitable about Catalan independence. Sure. Um, but uh, I do think that some of the tactics, from what we've seen in our, our highly slanted and biased media, was, uh, you know, was disproportionate. But, you know, the media obviously hasn't been covering a lot of the attacks against uh, moderate Spanish institutions by Catalans over the last goodness knows how many years. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure, listen, I'm sure there's, the, 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 there's been fault on that side, and I'm sure that calling this referendum, knowing it wasn't sanctioned by national government, was a provocative act. But goodness me, they couldn't, I think they couldn't believe, the separatists in some ways couldn't believe their luck when the Spanish government overreacted the way that it did. Andrew, I thank you. Uh, now, we will go back to Theo Usherwood, but we're having a bit of trouble with Signal. It all sounded rather dramatic, didn't it? Um, Adam is in New Denham. Adam, good morning. Hello there, Nigel. So am um, I right in thinking, Adam, that the police overreacted hugely last week and that will drive more people into the arms of separation? Oh, it was a, it's the best publicity the Catalan um, movement could ever, ever want. Yeah. Now, if you take, uh, I'd like to just draw a parallel here, and also I'd like to put in my, my reason for why the Catalans have gone for independence now, uh, which you may be interested in. But first, let me just draw a parallel with Northern Ireland. We were able to hold a peace deal, a negotiation with people who have been bombing and killing and carrying out terrorist activities for over 40 years. We were able to do that. I mean, yep. as much as I despise Blair, I think we've come out with a good deal from the Northern Ireland Agreement. OK, so Catalan, why... So, 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 Adam, tell me, why now for the Catalan separatists? Why now? Catalonia has always produced more GDP yep. for Spain than it's actually used. Uh -huh. Up until a few years ago, they always received back a rebate to actually say, you've actually produced more for the economy than you've used. They had that rebate cut... Just like Slovenia in the Yugoslavia breakup, yep. they're thinking, well, hang about, we're producing a lot, we're not getting it back, we are supporting other areas of Spain, why are we working and producing more than other people? So do you, it sounds a bit like the EU, doesn't it? Yeah, you think money's at the heart of this, yeah? Always. In, um, when it, 
politics uh, goes out the window when it comes down to people's finances and whether they think they're having okay. a meeting taken. Okay. As as, uh, you may be right, Adam, but there is also there's, there's also some history going back centuries of of Catalans being crushed once or twice, etc. I thank you for your call. Don't forget, I'm going to reveal soon why Hillary Clinton hates me as much as she does. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show. So hundreds of people are gathering in central Barcelona and they're rallying and they're protesting against the Catalan government's desire for independence and perhaps an announcement that will come on Tuesday. So there are, as our first caller said, two sides to this debate. Important to know that and to remember that separatism for Catalonia has always been in the minority. But my feeling is the actions of the Spanish police last week and indeed the European Union in backing them up will drive more people into the arms of the separatist movement. Philip says to me by text, there is no excuse for what happened in Spain. And Philip, I think that just about sums the whole thing up. Gary has been doing some thinking on Twitter. He says the Prime Minister should announce that post-Brexit the UK will look to form close links with an independent Catalonia incentivising UK tourists to go there to go there in preference to the rest of Spain. Play the EU at their own game. Promote division and conquer. Alright Gary, that's quite a lot to think about. Um, Robin is calling from Herne Hill. Robin, hello. Hello, uh, Nigel. So, um, what did you think of what the police did last Sunday, Robin? Well, I thought it was um, a back-to-the-future type of thing that uh, Spain has always looked on that part of um, uh, Catalonia as troublemakers because of um, even when George Orwell was, was over there. Uh-huh. Uh, and um, it, in some ways, it's good news for us because we, people can see what the European Union is really like. Do you know what? Not, That's what I think, too. Yeah, and uh, I'm by no means right wing because I think that certain things like uh, energy should be capped. But anyway, that's another situation. But I'm stunned that no media lovers or the left have come out and condemned this. I mean, somebody like Tony Benn or Eric Heffer or Michael Foot would have done. Yes, yes, they absolutely would have done. Robin, you're right. But of course, now the political class and nearly all of the Parliamentary Labour Party are all EU fanatics. They love it. And the reason people don't want to talk about it is the threat of Catalonia breaking away is a much bigger threat to the European Union. It makes Brexit look like a Sunday afternoon picnic. So they're terrified of it and they want it simply to go away. And, and Robin, the odds are, or certainly before last Sunday, that Catalan uh, separatism was a clear minority. And yet I just wonder whether the events of last week would have, would, would have changed that and made more people think, do you know what, to hell with Madrid, to hell with Brussels, we're a wealthy little region, we'll become a country and go it on our own. Yeah, um, also, uh, the, the terrorist attack, the, the, they did act as one. But even then, the Prime Minister was booed by some people in Catalan, and I'm amazed that the left lining up with Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan to stay in the EU. Uh, Robin, on? Robin, I don't get it. I see Bob Geldof uh, occasionally leading protests in London. 25,000 young left-wing protesters all on the side of Goldman Sachs. I can't work it out either. Robin, I thank you. Now, we're going to Maidenhead and Nemesio. Is that the right pronunciation? Yes, that's right, yes. Good morning. Good morning, Nigel. So, come on, tell me, have I got this right or wrong? No, wrong. Wrong, OK. You're, you're, you're not giving the balanced view. You are just uh, on the, seems to be on the side of the separatists. Right? Well, well, can I just say, can I just say very quickly, and look, I'll give you the floor, can I just say that I'm not on the side of the separatists. I've never had any feeling for the Catalan separatists, but I do genuinely think that what happened last week was outrageous, uh, and it says a lot about Spain and the European Union that people can defend that kind of behaviour. It would have been much cleverer to allow the referendum to go ahead, to say to people who want Spain to stay united, just boycott it, don't bother to turn up, don't give it legitimacy. And I just feel, the Messio, that by acting the way they have, that more people will be driven towards it. So I'm not taking sides, but the Messio, you're on LBC, you're Spanish, you feel strongly about it. Tell me how you see it. Well, uh, uh, I watch very... Every night I watch the Spanish news. There's a channel called 24 Hours. Mm -hmm. 24 Hours from R RTV and then the 24 Hour News, okay? Yep. And every weekday at about 9 o'clock English time, uh, 
they have a, a discussion on political things, and they are uh, the people that discussed in this program are top journalists from the top newspapers in Spain, and they give the facts. I don't know if you know that the only how many people were taken to hospital. Four uh, people. Nine hundred injured. <laughs> this is their story. Yeah. What? Some some lady bandaged bandaged the wrong hand, and they show it to the camera. <laughs> you know. The, the 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 voting boxes were were translucent. You couldn't see what's inside until they and they already had votes in it when they were taken to the the stations. Some voted in the street. Some people voted four times. This is documented. Okay. And the, another thing I want to say is about the indoctrination of the children in the schools. Okay. Uh, yeah. Children of five years old are told by taught by the parents and taken in front of the of the Spanish police, which are the Spanish police, okay? Police of Spain, and call them son of a bitch, bastards, five year olds. Do you think this is correct? No, I don't. And often right. often separatist movements do have some a really, really unpleasant sides to them. Of that there is no doubt at all. Uh, look, whatever you say about those that went to hospital or didn't, the fact is, I think it's difficult to deny that the Spanish government's reaction was very heavy-handed in trying to stop a vote taking place. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree that the image they gave is, yes. is horrible. Yes. Terrible. And, they, and, and, and haven't they, haven't they, because of the way they behaved and the images... And, and, and the global reaction, albeit not, yeah. from our, not from our friends in Brussels, but the general <laughs> global reaction, they have actually made... You see, we had this. We had this, Domestio, mm. just over 100 years ago. We had a rebellion, an uprising in Dublin from an Irish separatist movement who were very much in the minority, right? Mm. British reaction was to send the Navy up the River Liffey, start shelling parts of Dublin, round up the ringleaders, shoot them, and in doing that, in doing that, we actually turned the argument the other way, and more people embraced Irish nationalism. And I just think that more people are going to embrace Catalan separatism because of that behaviour last week. Another thing I would, just quickly, sure. is the LBC, last Thursday you had a person from the left uh, left, left party yep. Yep. in Catalonia. Yes. I tried to ring you on Thursday, but I couldn't get through. Okay. And then yesterday, uh, some other, other other show they had somebody from the uh, also from the separatist group. Can we get somebody? From the government side. Yeah, well, 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 radio, well okay, okay, right. In defence of LBC and myself, that is why Theo Usherwood right now is in the centre of Barcelona with that march that is going on, and that march are people who want Spain to stay united. So, Nemesio, thank you for your call. You know, if we do get things wrong, if we get the balance wrong, we should know, but that is why Theo Asher is there, to make sure that we do represent both sides of this story. Camillo is my next caller from Bounds Green. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Nigel. Good morning. So, so, you're Spanish, are you? Yes, I am indeed. OK, and how do you feel about the images that were beamed around the world from Barcelona last Sunday? Uh, I'll tell you what I feel, but first of all, I would like to tell you something else. You shouldn't use the problems in Spain and Catalonia to attack the EU. It's two different things, two separate things, and you are mixing them up. Because every time the subject comes, you say the EU should have said, done something. What happened in Catalonia last Sunday was awful. Unfortunately, I have been predicting it for a long time uh -huh. that that was going to happen because precisely that's what the Catalan government wanted. They wanted it because they had no support anywhere and they wanted the pictures to be seen everywhere. They got what they wanted. The Spanish police weren't taking away people that weren't, were voting. They weren't on the queue to vote. They were barricading against the police, so the police couldn't take away the polling boxes. They want the polling boxes, something that the Catalan police, Spanish, Spain's democracy, if not, that wouldn't have happened, you know. Catalan police should have closed those polling stations. That was in order 
coming from the judge. It wasn't Spanish government decision. No, but people are allowed... order coming from the judge. But you can't people stop people. To vote. People are allowed to vote, Nigel. People yes, of course are they are. To vote in the sp- but depends on what for. This, the, the, Spanish, the Catalan government are saying this is a vote for independence. Unfortunately, in the Spanish constitution, unless they go to the Senate and they decide and they vote that they can vote for a referendum, that has to be changed for the proper channel. Imagine that the mayor of London decides, because we're, London doesn't need the UK, it's wealthy, we need, because this is all about money, it is all about money, yes. If the mayor of London says, okay, we want to recover from the United Kingdom, we are uh, going to vote in London. Uh, they have a vote in London, and the majority votes to break away from the United Kingdom. Yeah, but you see, it wouldn't, Camillo, because what would, what, what would happen is the British government, for once, would get something right, and they would say, right, these ballot boxes that are being set up next Sunday in schools and, 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 and wherever um, around London, this is a completely illegitimate referendum. Our advice is you boycott the whole thing and show it up to be a farce. What the Spanish government did was the opposite. Camillo, I thank you for your call. I'm for your passion and it is worth remembering you know a, a huge number of people do not want spain to be broken up i just think the government has pushed people a little bit closer to it in today's sunday times magazine there is a photograph on the front of hillary clinton and she's in london uh, she's been interviewed at some length by christina lamb of the sunday times uh, and she's here because she's got a book she's launching a book it's called what happened and it's why she didn't become the president of the united states of america and none of it's her fault absolutely in fact she's never ever got anything wrong in her entire life it's because of horrible awful vile people people who were behind brexit that then dared to get themselves involved in the American elections. She speaks of Farage with disgust. He came to the US to campaign for Trump and spent half of his remarks insulting me in a very personal way and talking about Trump as an alpha male, the silverback gorilla. I think of those images and what that says about what is acceptable and what's not. So I'm not acceptable. Um, I'm looking forward, actually, to reading a bit more of the book. The book is available. Uh, it's on sale for £20, published by Simon & Schuster. It's called What Happened, but perhaps should be renamed The Great Big Whinge. So there. Now, earlier on, we were talking to Theo Ashwood, who was amidst hundreds of people in the square in Barcelona. Uh, we were doing well for a little bit, then the line went, and I am hoping that Theo, LBC's political editor, is on the phone right now. I'm back, uh, Nigel. The demonstration is still going on. Tens of thousands uh, of campaigners, demonstrators, affiliated in some form with the Spanish uh, People's Party, that's Manuel Rajoy's, Rajoy's party in Madrid, uh, here in Spain, to try and keep Catalonia part of Spain. Now we saw the ugly scenes last week uh, when there were uh, when the referendum took place. It was deemed illegitimate, it was deemed illegal. Uh, riot police heavily clad in yep. black armor burst in, dragging women by the hair, beating elderly people up to try and stop that taking place. Today in central Barcelona, a very different atmosphere. The police are sitting, standing with their arms folded, eating donuts, smoking cigarettes, very, very relaxed because, of course, they don't. Uh, this is their this is their demonstration. This is Madrid's demonstration to try and persuade uh, Catalonia to remain part of Spain. And I've been speaking to a few people in the crowd uh, about why they're here and why they want unity rather than to allow, as they term it, the separatists to win. We're all very afraid of what the Catalan government is doing. Basically, they are taking us, bringing us to the ruin. They're ruining this country. You know. Why, why, why now? Companies are, leaving, companies are leaving the region. Everybody's very, very afraid. You know, this can be a disaster for Catalonia, economically and socially. You know, half of the half of the country is against the other half. It's a disaster. It feels a little bit like civil war. Not without the war, but at least their families are fighting, friends are fighting. It's a total disaster, both socially and economically. But why are they doing it? Some of them are fanatics, and some of them want to do it out of their, out of their own economic interests, you know? This is a very corrupt government. Madam, why is it important Spain stays together? 
it's, it's important because we are together, we are going to be better and we are going to be like uh, the, the last 40 years, we are trying to, to, to fight for the democracy and we are trying to stop separatism. We want to be together and we are going to stay better together. Do you think there will be violence this week? Do you think the separatists will get their way? Will the separatists win? I don't think so. We are more and we are, we are all together. We are now here today to stop separatism and I, I think we are going to win them. And we are, we are, we all, of, all of us have one heart and we, we are Catalan and Spanish also. So I think we are going to win. We are more. There's a lot of pro-EU flags here. There's a lot of U EU, European Union flags here. Yes. yes. We want to be European, European again. We are not going to, to permit this situation and we want to be Spanish and we are going to be Catalan and we have to we want to be from Europe that we are going to be fighting for the last 40 years so why are you here ah, okay because I'm a little bit uh, disappointed with the polit Catalan separatist uh, um, politicians because they are lying to us so many times and from long long time from 30 years already almost because they have you know the education they and they show they teach the children uh, as uh, changing the history changing a lot of things saying to the citizens that uh, that the rest of the state of Spain uh, is stealing, is stealing them because uh, they afford more taxes than they receive in investments. But this is not such a huge uh, uh, hole. It's, it's, it's not so much there. I mean, they're doing so many crazy statements that are not true. And then the people. Uh, a lot of people believe them, and then uh, they want to separate. They say, "No, we are. We don't want to belong to." The, 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 the Catalonia gets less taxes than they they create. Uh, the Catalan um, community is a region. Sorry, no. is is very. It's, it has a lot of industry, a lot of tourists, a lot of uh, um, businesses, and then it's rich. It's rich in the sense of creating creating uh, value, but. And then they pay the taxes as the rest of the Spanish uh, people. And then they get back from the state uh, amounts on investments and so other kind of. And, and it's true, the richest, uh, the richest parts are the ones that afford more than the poorest. No, they receive the poorest. But this redistribu redistribution, redistribution yeah. of the of the of the of the richness. So it's not. It's not. I think it's not a problem. I think. No. Do you think that today people are trying? Spain is trying to say to Catalonia. Catalonia, we love you, we want you to stay. Yeah, of course, of course. All these people is here because they want to be, continue to be together. Remarkable, Theo. Are you still there? Still here? Yeah, remarkable how some of those arguments, they were echoes of what we heard used in our referendum in this country about Britain and the European Union, just as a lot more passion uh, there and people out on the streets in their numbers. Is there any indication, Theo, as to what is going to happen in the Catalan Parliament on, on Tuesday afternoon. The Catalan Parliament was due to meet on Monday. Yeah. You're quite right to pick up on that. Yeah. Uh, that's now, that session has now been suspended by the government in Madrid. Carlos Figamor, the president of Catalonia, is then due to address the parliament uh, here in Barcelona on Tuesday. And it's a little bit unclear as to how far he's going to go. He's under pressure from his own side, Nigel, yeah. to use the referendum result, the overwhelming referendum result, to leave uh, the rest of Spray Spain as the moment to declare independence. Today's demonstration and what we saw yesterday both here in Barcelona and in Madrid was actually pressure being put on him from the other side to say to try and row back, to try and find a way of starting a dialogue. But this is a region, Nigel, this goes back to 1975 and the fall of General Franco. This is a region that has had its language suppressed, its culture suppressed, uh, and then it, over the years it's, it's been able to get that back. And what's happened is it, because, and the woman hit on it there, he said this is the richest part of Spain because of tourism, because of industry. It generates a huge amount of taxes which goes into the coffers of Madrid and then what they get back in terms of bursaries, grants, direct funding from Madrid is a lot less than that. And that's created a resentment. Sa that the same arguments. Government here, same arguments. Same arguments as we had in the, the referendum. Government. Yeah, absolutely. 
yeah. and that's created the resentment, Nigel, that they want to say, well, hang on a moment, we could be better off out yeah. on our own, with our own economy, with our own culture, and we don't need Madrid. Theo, thanks ever so much, and keep us in touch in the next couple of days. Could, I mean, there is the possibility of some very dramatic events. We did actually get a slight softening from the Spanish government yesterday, where they virtually apologised for some of the things that had happened last Sunday. So there is, uh, there has been in the last 24 hours, uh, a slight de-escalation of the language, but this will be a very dramatic speech by the Catalan president that takes place on Tuesday. Dave is calling me from Colesden in Surrey. Dave, what do you make of the pro-Spain march today? Hello, Nigel. Well, it's very important, and it's very important for us. And I want to bring something out that you've highlighted, but you haven't co totally exposed. Okay. And that is, what, what are the powers of the police when they are under assault from the public? I mean, in England, we've seen many times people in balaclavas marching, smashing things up. And the media are able to show a policeman with a baton who has been under attack. Now, that policeman could be your son or your father, your uncle and they are being goaded by a mob with things chucked at them. Yes. And all of the political debate is able to change on one photograph. We've seen it so often, the worst type of media manipulation. Do we want the rule of law or not? And what should be done about it? What's done to protect our policemen I... in this country and in Spain? Dave, I do understand what you say, that one photograph uh, can change our perception of an entire event. You're absolutely right to point that out. However, there wasn't much goading going on when there were people in their late 70s queuing up to vote last Sunday and were forcibly knocked to the ground and dragged away. I, you know, I mean, like you, I'm always sceptical about any story and how it's portrayed. I have to say, I believe the accounts that I've listened to and that I've read of innocent people going to vote, being subjected to violence. Nigel, I'm not disputing one thing you did say, which was the 1916 Easter Rising was a brilliant analogy, the way that the reason all to the whole debate. Yeah. But we've got to have a more grown-up conversation about this Catalonia situation. This Catalonia situation is almost an insurgency by a minority. And we've got to think about what that means. The media seem to be granting them victim status before we've started in every area, uh -huh. even beyond the propaganda debate. They are a minority. People in Catalonia, as a majority, do not want to leave. What does this mean for the SNP? Are they next? Well, Dave, you're... Everything you say there is absolutely right, or it was right until last Sunday. I just think, and that's the reason I use the Irish analogy, I just think that the way they behave will drive more people in that direction. Dave, thank you for your call. You're listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show. Well, both sides of this debate about Catalonia are being put clearly on LBC, and in fact, I think we've got Theo Usherwood there on the ground, and he'll be there over the course of the next couple of days. You know, you'll hear it here first on LBC. Now, my next caller is ringing from South Korea, from Seoul, and it's Zabi. Good. Um, what what time of the day is it there? Hello there. It's, it's evening. It's uh, 10 to, to 8 uh, in the evening, De so well, almost uh, night here. Well, good evening, and you were put through it. I'm told that you are Catalan, but now living in South Korea. Yeah. So tell yeah, me... I'm, I'm from Barcelona. I'm currently, I'm currently living there, and I've been listening to some of the calls that you've been having uh, for the last uh, half an hour or so, yep. and uh, I'd like to—I mean, I'd like to point out some things that I don't see uh, very. I don't. I don't understand that because they keep on saying that uh, Catalan people that want to uh, leave Spain are a minority, and they are not a minority. If you look at the parliament; they are the majority, in fact. So, so that's that's the first thing that I don't understand. Then the other thing I heard somebody saying that companies are leaving that Catalonia, and maybe you have read that some of the banks are yep. like changing. Their, their address or something like that. Well, that, that's only a change of address. Uh, it's not nothing uh, to be worried about. They are not leaving the, the country. They are not leaving Barcelona. I mean, we, we still have the banks. We still have the workers. So there's nothing there. It's just, it's just you, 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 I think you understand that. It's just kind of a, a fear, you know, it's putting uh, fear into the people. So uh, yeah. because at the end, what they don't want to talk about is letting people decide why that's what they want to do. I mean, at the end, just that problem, and Spain is having that problem, not, not, not listening to people, and just 
Well, let me just, Zabi, let me just pick up on two points. Firstly, you know, the last polling that I saw said that in a referendum, yeah. about 41% would vote for separation, which is up from 15% 20 years ago. So the last polling we saw suggested that it was a minority, but that may have changed after last Sunday. Your point about the banks and businesses is fascinating. So before last Sunday... This was never an argument that was heard. Now, the prospect that Catalonia may secede has led to the banks saying they would leave. Um, and it's actually almost a rerun of the arguments that we had in the British referendum. But, Zabi, let me ask you, um, if you were back in Barcelona, or if there was a defining referendum, would you yourself vote for Catalan independence? I would. Nowadays, I would. Yes, of course. Yes. So, and, and I and I think it means a lot of people that they would vote against that that uh, independent like fifteen days ago. But now they are. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. That's but that's. Exactly what I think. And how would you just let me ask you this one last question, if I can? So, Catalonia, if it was to secede in that referendum, would you think it's important for Catalonia to join the European Union, or wouldn't that worry you? Would independence be what you'd be going for? <laughs> No, I wouldn't be worried at all. I mean, there are some, some tweets that we could, uh, you know, add to that tweet. I mean, we, we could get into those tweets for, for commerce and for, for this kind of things. But the European Union is just a, a club for partners. I mean, there's partners, the partners club with uh, countries doing whatever they want and they don't care about anything else. So if you are in, you're good. And if you're out, you're, you're the same, but out. I mean, you can live outside the European Union, that's for sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Zabi. Interesting. So, I'm hearing Eurosceptic arguments being made by Spaniards. Things that I've been t I'm told I was an awful person for suggesting that countries could survive outside. There we are. John in Glasgow. Good morning. Good morning. The uh, actions of the Catalan government um, have de definitely uh, uh, inflamed and aggravated the situation. It's been provocative. But yes. the Spanish government themselves uh, have deepened the crisis with their ham-fisted, heavy-handed approach and undoubtedly alienated a lot of people and driven a great many more people in short term into the hands of the Catalan nationalists. But the question really here, Nigel, is where all this comes from. It comes mainly from the European Union, um, their idea of weakening nation-states, this almost regionalisation. I know. Tony Blair, yep. it's, become, it's almost yep. become like the Scottish regional government, the Welsh regional government, and all that's happened with this devil in the last 20 years is they've provided a platform which people like uh, the Catalan uh, nationalists, like the Scottish nationalists, have taken over as their own platform. And I would remind a lot of people that as recently as three or four months ago, uh, Nicola Sturgeon was even threatening in the same kind of provocative, inflammatory way to hold a second referendum here in Scotland, regardless of what any anybody else in the UK thought. Yeah, no, absolutely. John, do you know what? We debated this in Strasbourg at some length last week, because as you say, one of the great aims of the European Union has been to regionalise countries, the sort of old-fashioned divide and conquer, take away people's feeling for a nation, replace that with its feeling for, uh, you know, its own region, its own identity, but within a European framework. And funny enough, Tony Benn predicted this in the 1975 referendum. Benn said that what will happen is they will gradually try to break up the United Kingdom through grant money, etc., etc. But, John, but, John, in the past, I mean, for example, Sinn Féin, you know, the European Commission loves Sinn Féin. They're fantastic now, because Sinn Féin want to do more damage to the United Kingdom, but be absolutely committed as supporters of the EU. What they're terrified of, John, is this Catalan independence movement is something different. It's actually quite a strong cultural thing. And what they're, what they're terrified of, they're terrified that the Catalans stick two fingers up to Madrid and to Brussels, and they see that as the beginning of the end of the entire European project. So that's my take on it, John. Would you agree with that? Well, I, I, I do agree with many, many parts of that. But it's inflammatory. And the European Union, they've, they've tried to have it both ways here. Yes. I mean, they, in the wake of our referendum uh, re result last, uh, last year to leave the European Union, they rolled out the red carpet for Nicola Sturgeon um, for their own purposes. Um, she is not their negotiating partner. Um, uh, and she has similar agendas to people like the Catalan government, we've had to see, seen the police up here unified, 
Um, it started off as a Scottish executive when yes. the revolution started. They anointed themselves then as a Scottish government. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it moves on. They now want to do away with British transport police. But this is, they're now reaping... Um, the, the, but can you the, imagine, the John? The back, the back draft from all of Can this. you imagine, John? I mean, those those louts that supported Scottish separation that that assaulted me in the street in Glasgow. Can you imagine if the British police went and roughed them up? I mean, the first people to condemn it all would have been the European Union, and in this case, not a dicky bird. John, I thank you very much indeed for your call. I've no idea what will happen on Tuesday. I've no idea whether um, the Catalan president will go through with this full push for independence or not. Uh, what I am certain of is the behaviour of the Spanish police and its support from Brussels and the European Commission actually has done the separatist cause one whole lot of good. You've been listening to the Sunday edition of the Nigel Farage Show.